Yeah, welcome back to High Performance Computing, our first lecture, one that is really introducing the high performance computing basics. And in the first part of this lecture, we really have seen um, terminologies really of system architecture, shared memory, distributed memory. We have to look a little bit about caches, about multi-core chips, uh, what that means. And of course, also why we refer often in HPC to supercomputing and uh, the top 500 list, which is a very important list in one way, uh, but also we have seen the idea of benchmarks where basically application benchmarks give you a very good idea of how your own application or the ones from domain scientists really can work on these systems. So this is really an interesting part um, and the basics will remain. Uh, always this notion of performance is also, of course, something which we kind of started to think when we want to have something in parallel and then to improve the performance by performing parallel computing. But of course, in subsequent lectures, we really will go towards this much more in detail. So what it really means to have a speed up of your process um, when you apply two, four, 16 processors instead of just one. So this will be all something, of course, coming also to the to the next lectures. We will see how we start programming in parallel so that you can start with your assignments early already in the next lecture when we have MPI introduced, the message passing interface to really send different messages between different parallel processings. Um, the idea of the second part of the lecture is really now to think more broadly about high performance computing. Uh, in one way, this would be the ecosystem. So meaning what is around basically there in, in HPC, what are further terminologies, how you create uh, such a system. You have something like racks and blades. You will see the evolution of HPC systems in this ecosystem. Some people will refer to this as a very, let's say, lively ecosystem because we are always at the cutting edge of performance and there's always a kind of disruptive technology coming along. While in the past, people have suddenly started to think that many core chips like GPUs we will come to in a moment are really disruptive. They are normal kind of modus operandi today, right? But today people will much more think now that quantum computing, neuromorphic computing that you maybe have seen in the video, um, basically also uh, as one of the modules, these are now the things where we think that is disruptive technology and will, which will shape HPC in the next five to 10 years. So that's a quite interesting art, um, so to speak, an, an art of bringing really different pieces together yet seen the four building blocks. So let us look now a little bit into the HPC ecosystem and all the technologies. We have started really the course with kind of Unix and with this, you don't really have pure Unix there. You would have CentOS and maybe other reduced Linuxes um, that's not the point, but usually you had have a Unix operating systems. We see Windows HPC clusters coming along. So also here and there, Windows are um, uh, basically HPC machines, but they are, let's say, not really the majority. What you will see throughout the course is that such a HPC system is not yours alone. They cost usually lots of money, lots of millions in the idea of jewels that you have seen in the video, number one in Europe but also your turn and also even the deep test cluster had, let's say lots of GPUs here, the deep test cluster, this already costs. So you usually have that these supercomputers and this HPC machines are kind of shared between different user communities. And with this, you have to have one system. We call them scheduling systems that schedules different users, different algorithms at certain point of time in a queue and then the queue and the scheduler, that is basically this technology like Slurm, um, we'll then make sure that firstly, it's get, let's say, to the right processors at the right time. And of course, that it's not overlapping or let's say interfere with other users and their jobs. And with this, you can imagine this is a very important uh, HPC system software that we will come again and again. Also, particularly in my practical lecture one one that I will provide you next time where we look a little bit what that is, what a scheduling system is and what, what it doesn't mean really to have this batch queues. Now, when you think that these HPC systems are quite complex systems, you have seen networks, different racks, lots of CPUs, you need some monitoring system, not only to 
see how much users are there on and what is the system load. Also, what's the status of the system? So are several CPUs broken? Is the network interconnect not working? Is maybe the file system down? All of this are referring to some way of a monitoring system that is always required. And then there's a different part um, in the HPC system software, which is really then related to a big part of it, which means the performance. So you would have lots of programs that help you not only to understand the performance of your parallel application, but also to significantly improve it. There are tools like Scalaska and Vampire we will look into lecture eight when we think about the parallel performance analysis, uh, which goes much more broader than just debugging and, and profiling maybe your systems. You have really analysis of patterns of different performance problems. And we will come to this then in lecture eight. But all of these HPC system software parts you see here are kind of a key requirement. You will rarely find a HPC system starting from U-Twin. It had basically all of these two, what's the really cutting edge of jewels, um, these kind of the really required systems. While performance is, of course, something where you can argue if you are trusting that your application is already perfect, you can always think about the placement then on your software on these different systems might be having also performance issues. It's not only your application, it's maybe how it is different, differently executed in parallel. So still worth looking in performance analysis. Right, when you think now about um, the scheduling I said, um, you would think like maybe some of you from the data science domain, particularly, um, how I compute this thing when I want to have, let's say, my typical Jupyter environment, right? I have a Jupyter notebook. This is quite attractive. We not only do it in our complementary cloud computing course a lot, we also do it uh, in the data science community as large. And there you want to have a GPU directly at your disposal. You want to have directly let's say, in execution. You don't want to wait quite a long of time. However, in these data science approaches, usually you would have, especially if you're experimenting with some data science tools, um, often an idea to, to not directly, let's say, um, have 96 GPUs together to really scale largely. You maybe have smaller jobs that you don't really require to have in a batch mode, so to speak. Here, you really talk about this interactive supercomputing, which is actually becoming more attractive more and more. And here's one way how you can access such a system. Uh, you don't need to know exactly all of these different steps, but in order to, of course, basically have a Jupyter Hub or a browser-based access really to a computer, as a, like a supercomputer, you need, of course, also identity management. It, it refers a little bit what we learned already of SSH, of username, password, and one technology that you have here that is actually realizing this is Unicore. It gives an access together with Jupyter Hub and uh, basically then the Unity identity management for this. And we will have some examples in the course uh, when we come basically to data science problems using HPC, but uh, it is a larger area of supercomputing really to make it more interactive these days to maybe steer then parts of the supercomputing up simulation during the runtime and to have an interactive channel. Now, when you think about um, HPC system architectures, let's come back a little bit to this with a broader picture, right? We started with a multi-course, but what you see today uh, is, is, is kind of two things. Firstly, very old architectures quickly running, you know, obsolete, they're going out of date, they have been quite around for some time. And you see here a very famous picture of our supercomputer Blue Gene Q, which was a very strong systems in the past, based on long history of a Blue Gene L, uh, of a Blue Gene P, and then a Blue Gene Q. So you see a, basically a complete line of a vendor of supercomputers. And they had also different specialities to program them. When you go to different systems, this will be the same thing. However, the basics remain the same. You would still use OpenMP, you use basically MPI, but the tuning capabilities of multi-threading, for instance, or basically, of course, in newer versions of this, the ideas of interconnects, network topology supported, and of course, the advent of many core chips now, they change the system architecture significantly. And with this, we have really an interesting, let's say, momentum in these HPC system architectures so that uh, it has quite some impact that this technology is changing all the time. Um, and we will see when we look a little bit more about many cores also how quickly they're 
the ideas of changing always technology and how it impacts actually a quite established field of HPC um, quite significantly. I brought you this example um, saying that, of course, we said that the supercomputer blue gene Q is kind of obsolete. There is no blue gene series anymore from EBM. So, but the message I want to, you know, leave you on the table is that, of course, some of the terminologies are still remain the same. So we have still a system which is usually compiled as a, you know, forms of several racks. And a rack is sometimes hidden. You barely see it, but essentially these parts here of this is all in different racks and meaning a red rack then basically is a very interesting dense way of putting lots of lots of lots of cores in and they are usually in so-called node cards organized which are really of course all of them have a very good interconnect together um, here is also where it starts to think about cooling but it's something what we have also in later um, parts of this lectures again revealed um, in former times, there are lots of air cooling, thinking about heat coming out and coal basically cooling coming in. Today, we have more liquid cooling um, and also even that the, let's say, the heat that comes out of a supercomputer can actually also um, actually heat up buildings today. But this is not really the, the key idea of the lecture today. Here's rather to think about that, you know, these large systems still, the key ingredient on the lowest level is a processor. And this is important. There's no difference than you would have in your laptop, in a sense. Of course, these are specialized chips that go to specialized compute cards that then very densely get together on so-called note cards that you then can include in the rack. And you can imagine if so many compute um, chips with, you know, that really create lots of heat are so densely basically put in such a rack, we will see when we have the opportunity, hopefully, to go in one of our, you know, computing centers, um, that there are lots of heat coming out. And uh, basically, this is a key consideration, of course, how you do the cooling. Um, and because the cooling also can have lots of energy impact. Right. And with this, you see that even the smallest chip um, can then actually be the Lego building block, if you want, of a very, very large system uh, with lots of lots of racks. And this is the idea. Um, that we have seen, for instance, and also when these architectures were evolving to more and more racks that actually filled then more and more of a hall. So, <clears throat> but the computing is just one part of it. We also said HPC is defined by really having extraordinary network topologies and interconnects. And this by far today means InfiniBand. We have basically Mellanox often in these systems um, that have a very good uh, network. We have different topologies, so we cannot only communicate basically to, let's say, my left and right neighbor. There are also different dimensions of topologies. And we will see when we go through all of these different applications here today in later parts of the lecture, admittedly, when we look a little bit more to the domain specific sciences that leverage HPC systems, that these network interconnects are really exploited. You have already seen in the video the Vulcan um, ashes, they have seen how jewels is used from these scientific applications. All of them, for instance, make nearest neighbor communication um, on basically then have another way of communicating in parallel to maybe a couple of cores or basically different nodes that are basically far away. However, in order to do this, you really need good communication patterns and you need, of course, and really the hardware, a really dedicated fast interconnect including, of course, and not forgetting that you have data. So here's an idea how that could look like. You have lots of compute nodes, but you have to think about that there's also file servers and lots of data. And by today, I think this is more the challenge that you have still um, of having kind of a bottleneck from the computer, the file servers. We see we have there a parallel file systems. We will also have in one of the lectures much more revealed and also being slightly part of your assignments. But um, there's, of course, a big problem of when you have remembering, uh, remembered maybe the 500,000 uh, cores which are in machines. So how do all these compute cores write to disk? And there you need to be, again, certain, let's say, throughput, which, again, uh, falls back, of course, now to the network interconnect, but also 
basically what type of nodes you have. You can have dedicated IO nodes, for instance. So uh, this will also come in, in subsequent lectures, right? But the key message is really HPC is really driven by this, um, by having also then the main motivator of HPC systems. We don't do that for Bitcoin mining. We don't do that for fun or for gaming. We do this for the scientific applications that really require such a communication pattern, such good network topologies. Now, when you think about the system architectures and continuous developments, I would like to refer to a massive, a massive way of, of possibilities. You have uh, lots of ideas of co cutting edge technologies can maybe be integrated. One interesting example is, for instance, network attached memory that we have just essentially in our research project, which is not on the market. Right. We have one paper about it. We have we're experimenting with it. What does it mean to have a memory on the network instead of closely to the ship? You maybe can share more data with other users and, and in a more high performant manner than just putting everything to disk. And you have seen the non volatile memory coming into the game these days. We have seen the many core chips coming very, very quickly into the game of rising from, let's say, computer gaming into scientific and engineering computing with an, an extraordinary pace with one vendor that you all of know, NVIDIA being, let's say, a major market um, vendor today in this area, but of course, influencing lots of system architectures. You have seen Jewels is also using NVIDIA technology as also using lots of the US systems in the top 500. There are more, let's say, specialized systems, what you could do with the so-called FPGAs and this would be almost a kind of programming them and, you know, kind of understanding them really another lecture series, really. But think of them as really interesting connections and like a CPU, but they can be much more reconfigured and rewired essentially in this integrated circuit. It's more technical, so it's not really part of this course, but of course, something you could think about. And then we have seen in the past also certain cell processors, which had quite interesting capabilities. But the key message really, and that's why I brought AI today, is really that the system architectures were basically driven in the past much more by, let's say, physical laws, numerical methods, and different parallel applications or so simulations over time of different parallel, uh, you know, in physical processes. But today we really see an influence of AI. So AI is more and more using HPC is contributing to the workload of HPC systems. And with this, you have a complete different requirement here and there, right? Of course, it's still compute intensive in a way, but it comes also to the point of being data intensive as well. While HPC applications in the past in the simulation of physics also are quite data intensive, um, here the idea of using the system is of course a little bit different than we have in this physical situations. You analyze data, big data these days, and you want to do this in a very powerful fashion. And this AI really has then given rise to, to, to many uh, interesting aspects of HPC architectures and the ecosystems. We see today really that the shift of computing is more and more happening from CPUs to GPUs. And this is now a complete different idea how you have such a GPU. We, let's look a little bit into this GPU device to really understand it. First of all, a GPU, it's important to notice, cannot really operate on its own. So you still need a CPU, a general purpose CPU that we have seen in the first part of the lecture, which could be a multi-core chip. And the way how you get data from the CPU to the GPU is usually through the main memory and then through the device memory, which is considered to be today still kind of a major bottleneck or a challenge really to work on. There are different solutions for this. But of course, um, this is kind of the major limit if you want to have, let's say, many, many GPUs interconnected. You have to have not only the memory very well connected, but also think about the bypass of, let's say, going through the main memory. We will see in the GPU lecture there are certain solutions to this with NVLink and we switch from NVIDIA or the GPU direct interface where you can kind of directly go to this memory space. But this is something for this lecture then in lecture nine. Here to understand it in the beginning of the course, it's perhaps much better to understand that actually in comparison to have the multi-core CPU, a many core chip like this GPU has really many, many, many processors. And now you would argue why they don't do this with a multi-core chip and just 
having also there more and more processes. And again, it's about the, the frequency, the clock frequency, the heartbeat of the CPU. Here we talk about many moderate you know, processors with a, let's say, not so high single thread performance as we have in CPUs, but hundreds of them. So here the emphasis is on throughput, do very much calculations in the same way, but with many, many hundreds of threads. So in a way, uh, a little bit, you could say it's shared memory, right? They want to have, you know, always have the device memory and then do the same on all of these GPUs. Um, so let's see how that is as an example to be, you know, seen. You see here already the number of an example with a, let's say, older NVIDIA smaller card, but still very relevant, where you have already 128 cores on one single GPU chip. These days we have much more of them. But the point is to understand that these threads can all be working in parallel when you have, let's say, different uh, here uh, number of threads working on these different processors, leading suddenly very quickly to a large amount of threads. Of course, admittedly, we say they're not very powerful in terms of computing, right, compared to a CPU. Still, we have a lot of threads can, that can work on parallel. And this has several different advantages. And you can come to different workloads where that matter. I think a very good one to understand is really here the color coding. When you think about, for instance, a deep learning cutting edge network, we will have one lecture where we talk about much more about deep learning and also accelerators in this context. But think about there's lots of matrix multiplication, matrix vector multiplication happening in these deep learning networks. And the way to understand GPUs would be here that you would have this color coding of this mathematical principle, how you would do now this matrix and vector multiplication you see immediately when you remember a little bit from math how that would look like to get the result to be computed, you can do this independent, right, from the other colors. And this gives you an enormous advantage. This means these can be completely in parallel computed without ever required to know essentially what the result of the others are. You just have a different part in the device memory, you put it there, and you'd, you're done. But of course, this could be all differently by threads executed in the GPU. Now, of course, when you think about cutting edge deep learning algorithms, these matrices are not in the order of four by four here as a matrix. These are, let's say, multi-dimensional. They are much larger. And with this, this power of really breaking it into independent parts, which are independent is a very important part here. Um, but doing the same calculation, right? We, we, we don't change the mathematical principles all the same. It's just different data. This makes it so powerful, this concept of combining GPUs with CPUs. So we see here something which perhaps will never be the only way of computing, but it's an important part of computing and always will complement the general purpose computing that we have more or less in the CPU uh, to a significant part as we see. Um, just a bit more on deep learning because it has quite an impact in that factor and I think many of you are not puzzled what the heck does he mean by this. I give you a very quickly example here where you have neural networks um, which are basically learning then how you can basically recognize these handwritten characters. It's a very simple example admittedly but you see a neural net has these interesting neurons uh, all connected. Here's a simple perceptron and you can learn the weights so-called connections and they emphasize um, basically over time iteratively by going through HPC systems so that you really are able after the training to recognize these numbers. Admittedly this is a high level statement we will look and see how that materializes when we look at lecture 10. However the key message is that in order to train this this weights of these connections and when you go on to more larger networks you see the the networks, inter basically the connections between all of these neurons become more and more important. layer perceptron. So here you, here you can now clearly see the different layers. I brought you also here a visual representation on the bottom where you see essentially these are different layers 
We call them also artificial neural network, a multi-layer perceptron uh, with having specific properties like a feed-forward connection, for instance. But these are all details which don't matter so much. But all of these different connections between these neurons, which are modeled like the human brain neuron, really, are able to learn over time certain weights. And these weights influence then how you compute certain elements in the neuron. And this will bring you over time to really create the numbers. Um, basically, you can write them and this network will recognize them, except there are those you see on the right hand, which is a common paradigm in machine learning. You maybe cannot learn everything, right? So accuracy of 100% in neural networks is still almost a challenge. It depends, of course, on the quality of the data. Nobody can really understand what was the initial rise of this number, right? However, one step more I want to bring for you is that this computing was already massive, but not necessarily something which, you know, was now uh, limited in the past. Now, when we have deep learning, this new word, this is really driven now by the many core technologies, you would have a different type of layers. You see that a little bit here. Instead of doing just neurons interconnecting them, like you see here, you will see in soon and in the video, we break down into different feature maps. And these are all convoluted with different subsampling strategies until you come then to a decision in the classification layer. And, and this means there are lots of computing in the, in the, in the, let's say, middle of this convolutional process from this convolutional network, so to speak, which actually are on the orders of magnitudes of let's say connections to to be computed especially if you think about that you have several of those layers here's a very let's say shallow deep learning network if you will usually you had with things like resnet 50 we will see in one of the lecture hell a lot of connections with parameters like 26 million to learn really so let's see how that looks a little bit in the video but more the details are then really given in lecture 10. Again, this was the neural network we talked about with the different layers. And now we're moving to a deep learning network. We see the strategy fundamentally changes. We not only have just connections, we have so-called feature maps. And these will also then, with different, let's say, windows, look on the properties and will identify certain aspects of the image and will broke it down to more and more smaller pieces. And it is quite fascinating technology, but you can see that today this deep learning is only possible because we have many core chips. And the new technologies which will come will have going to be one level further, where we talk about so-called spike in neural networks, which we don't really have to talk right now. It is a really, let's say, advanced um, way of computing this and will be also more explored in the future. So in a way, that's really what I want to leave on the table for you for the deep learning. Now, there are different of you know ways how you create those deep learning architectures. And it's another example that gives the complexity I want to allude to and why HPC is needed. First of all, you can imagine that satellites that you see here in the remote sensing area really continuously are up there and creating generous, you know, multi hyperspectral data set, which refers to different spectral channels in the Earth data sets, um, and, and this on a 24-7 basis. So essentially, we have big data at large, which requires computing to be understood, to have you know, deep learning, to analyze it. But that also means that you need it for different data sets, for big data, and this means HPC. However, what it's not really, perhaps for everybody, understandable yet is also the hell amount of uh, parameter that go with it. You see here features from a certain specific, uh, basically deep learning network. You have lots of optimizations. You have lots of, let's say, meta parameters to this neural networks, which require, you know, an identification. You don't know it by sure hand directly. So you play around with these parameters. You play around with meta parameters. You change the optimizers in these networks. You change certain activation functions. Maybe you change also then the number of layers or the convolutional layer filters and the feature map sizes. So all of this requires you to recompute and recompute and recompute, right? So finding hyperparameters, metaparameters, 
uh, is basically one of the most challenging aspects today uh, in basically machine learning and deep learning because this really is compute intensive and there's not a really directly principled way of doing it. There are evolutionary algorithms, there are, um, let's say, neural architecture search approaches towards this in a, let's say, automated or semi-automated fashion, but still it's not, let's say, perfect. And that's why uh, this hyperparameter, uh, finding those is really a, a kind of another computing challenge that you see. So hence you see that apart from all the physical simulations, we maybe started in the course with understanding the stress on an aircraft, for instance, we see also that AI is now requiring lots of lots of different, let's say computing for different purposes, not only the data sizes and maybe also the velocity of the data. So how often I have something new when you think about the satellites rotating around the earth uh, every time, every day, it's also that we have not completely always the idea how this deep learning architecture should look like. And this is something which we will learn in lecture 10 much more in detail. Now let us come then to the relationship of HPC briefly, because in lecture 10 we will review this a bit more. You could say that in the past you always were this traditional classification schemes and clustering machine learning algorithms quite safe. Uh, you have to use some serial computing with SkyKit Learn or with R or MATLAB. Veka, these are all more serial packages, although some of them have extensions like MATLAB, they have a parallel extension, but basically have used traditional learning models and the impact in compute, this is a red footprint, right? For training those models, for working on these models, it was quite low. But now as you come to the arena of big data and then using it with cutting edge deep learning networks, then you see that the footprint in computing gets extraordinary high. So here, you are in the sphere where really systems like Jewels are really required and, and large GPUs um, are really basically large numbers of GPUs are really required to work together to really train those systems and then use it with a very high accuracy in your applications. So this is really something we will look back and come back. And some of you know already this a little bit from the big data and cloud computing course where we talk much more about machine learning and deep learning like in this course here. That's why, of course, this part has a big impact already also in the big data course and the cloud computing course. So, and also this is why basically you could think of there's another world of parallel computing, um, which we have in the clouds, right? And it's a topic which is, of course, these days more and more getting intertwined with high performance computing, but still has a different paradigm. Um, and you see here one example where we use such cloud systems with an Apache Spark system which is uh, basically a specific system for big data analytics, often or basically in most of the clouds in MS Azure and Amazon uh, Web Services or in the Google Colab and Google uh, Cloud environments and Google Cloud Platform available. But this is things which we actually have much more revealed in the other complementary course of big data and parallel machine and deep learning. So why is basically this now with big data also a part in simulation sciences you can imagine. So when we want to have an earthquake simulated, for instance, that should be accurate. In the past, we were doing this with a so-called Terra shake performance or Terra flop performance and in the Peta flop performance. Um, and we come to this flop notion actually in one of the next lectures, floating point operations per second. So how fast we really are. And we had this in the beginning of the course again, if you remember with the laptop starting then over going to the different blue genes and then over to the cutting edge, which is now exaflop performance uh, quite much. But the key impact that you see here by having more and more computing means we compute more and more data, right? We have these different meshes. If you think about the idea of how accurate you are, how accurate you would basically have here, um, basically a simulation from San Diego really um, basically from the San Diego supercomputing center, really in a simulation, which actually performs, of course, on a much more detailed fashion if you increase the mesh sizes of the points where you simulate. But this is where you also pay the price, where you have then much more surface data rising from terabytes to petabytes. And this, of course, also true for the volume data. If you think about, we also are considering things in the earth when it's about earthquake. And this means also that in these days, we think about data, big data, much more also in the HPC areas for simulation sciences, 
and the the trouble and the challenge we have still today to make this really let's say it's extreme fast is still the idea of this drum gap so we would have the problem that the caches and the registers are extremely fast but also a bit let's say uh, not so uh, not so much in terms of storage so you have to go to main memory and there you lose already some of the performance however it's more affordable and even then you know that memory costs a lot you have to back down to disks or even tapes if it's long term archiving so all of this to get this into the cpus into the arithmetic units is a long way if you want and a costly way right before it. That's why the caches are usually relatively small compared to memory or disk sizes. And, and this is a key problem we have right now uh, still in the community. However, we see that this big data really drives different architectures. And you see here already a kind of different modules, different tiers to do different things. Uh, we see that more and more memory is important for certain applications while some of them maybe just require more disk space, but then should be very many of those. So you see that basically this kind of homogeneous system that you have is more and more looking towards hierarchical ideas, towards modular ideas we also had in the video about jewels, right? So this is related to it. And it's due to the fact that we have to think about the terabytes um, or data in general, data intensive sciences, data intensive access, to these systems is more important than just the pure computing power of flops per second these days. And this is drives new tier-based designs. Here's one of it. But of course, also the modular supercomputing design is in a way an idea of it. You have seen in the video, this cluster module with high single thread performance, a booster to scale out, and then maybe a data analytics module for things like Apache Spark we have seen. Or the more recent aspects I come to in a moment with a quantum annealer, right? So very interesting if you think about this, and Iceland was part of this, which spawned another activity um, which we have in the URCC project, where I want to also give you another perspective now of what things are happening in the future here in Iceland, what's happening in general in the ecosystem around Europe in HPC. Uh, there's a building of national competence centers all over Europe. We are in the URCC project also in Iceland, together with 33 other countries in Europe that create so-called competence centers. What we do here in Iceland is we establish a variety of simulation and data labs, and you're welcome to perform maybe your math thesis there to get involved with some of the simulation data labs uh, in the field of neurosciences, computational fluid dynamics, remote sensing materials, more and more we create, and uh, more, more of the scientists from Iceland, the PIs really you see here mostly working with HPC systems, are basically um, forming with us those labs to be a bit more structured as a community in this national competence center together as a bottom-up approach really and you will learn much more about this when we come to lecture 10 and 14 on the course now towards the end two perspectives when you think about large-scale computing infrastructures i could talk a long time about it i will come back to those you have those of the grid computing you maybe heard in the past with the um, higgs boson that was found at the cern laboratory in Switzerland, you basically have seen that grid computing was one key ingredient and grids by far have been transformed to cloud computing, still sharing many of the parallel computing ideas we have here in the course. However, there are also distributed infrastructures. If you think by using just one HPC system, you also would consider to have a grid of those HPC systems. So not only one HPC system, but you want to have maybe the one in Italy used instead of Germany because it has some application experts that can help you scaling up. You would like to go to US because you have a particular collaboration working on some data intensive aspects where the data sharing in US might be simpler than in Europe or there's just available data in US. So all of these are infrastructures, praise, Partnership for Advanced Computing in Europe and also the extreme science and engineering discovery environment exceed in the US. What they all have in common in a way is that they basically have diverse user communities. So it reaches up again from material scientists up to computational fluid dynamics, people understanding airflow from medicine up to neurosciences, uh, and basically then also earth system sciences. You will find lots of different user communities that using these large infrastructures. We will come back in this uh, also from time to time. And of course, the complementary cloud core is taught much more about this infrastructures idea like we can do here in our um, course in HPC.
So I would like to close a little bit with the um, idea of quantum computing, and this is loaded. Um, and of course, I could have a complete lecture series about it, and we don't do this very much in the course. We will have in lecture 10, a little bit a small um, part of it when we talk about one of our studies already, when I show you that we used already a D-wave quantum annealer. It's a specific type of quantum computing, quantum annealing, for a support vector machine, a quantum support vector machine working on then remote sensing data sets. So all that works is usually a bit different than conventional computing. Hence, it's a disruptive technology. We don't have just lots of zeros and ones anymore, as you know from the binary system. Here we're talking about actually a superposition of having one and zeros both simultaneously. Still, we compute this still and using this, uh, if you see here with a Jupyter notebook still uh, in a very, let's say, straightforward manner. But to compute this, of course, requires then much more mathematical thinking, much more thinking about how we can break these things down using qubits instead of this typical things we know from ones and zeros. And you see the, the vision is that this will be complemented with the typical things we know, the cluster module, the booster, things you know from the modular supercomputing quite well now. But there will be a quantum annealer in the future. Jülich is already building a building where a D-Wave system will be actually hosted. And with this, you can always, let's say, use it as one part of the module. You would say some of the machine learning optimization algorithms, they really can benefit from we computed on a quantum annealer, while many other general computing aspects still require maybe in deep learning the, the central cluster. And the same is true with neuromorphic devices that come. If you have interest in this area, there are of course also master thesis available, but uh, you see also I was invited here to the UT Messon uh, in one uh, basically last year uh, kind of presentation that is available on YouTube where I give, let's say, a small introduction to quantum computing really with a quantum annealing perspective, which might be interesting for you to look at. We reached essentially the end of the lecture again, so we have another video for you. Um, if in case the sound is not perfectly played and recorded, you will always find, of course, a link then in these references. So let's go to the video. flexibility, great endurance, unprecedented accuracy, unmatched strength. High performance computing uh, is like uh, the big all of the big instruments of science combined into one. So it's a telescope that enables us to view the entire universe. It's a microscope or a particle accelerator which enables us to explore the quantum world of the very small. It's a reactor that enables us to study plasmas uh, and what's going on in the interior of stars. And it's even a time machine which enables us to recreate the past or to predict what's going to happen in the future. Almost all of the major challenges that society faces, whether it's preserving our environment, improving our health care, or rebuilding our economy, uh, are underpinned in some way or another by high performance computing. By pursuing our dreams or looking for new perspectives, we test our instincts, abilities, knowledge and spirits that regularly go beyond physical boundaries and intellectual understanding about the surrounding world. Developed out of necessity for future scientific and engineering discoveries, supercomputers are recognized as an indispensable research instrument. However, 
supercomputing can only aid in the battle for finding the answers to long-standing questions that have excited human curiosity from its very beginning. These and many other questions constantly push us to observe and ask more about the world around us and beyond what our eyes can see. Building these investigations around models, we get simulations and new observations bringing new explanations based on the collected evidence. Equipped with the most powerful supercomputers, today's scientists and researchers have the potential to deal with the complexity of the phenomena by gathering new results and findings leading to further refinement of their initial ideas. Applying a comprehensive explanation supported by many facts and data gathered over time and generating new hypotheses to predict yet unobserved phenomena. Ultimately, supercomputers allow the hypotheses of our greatest minds to be explained or even rejected when compelling contradictory evidence comes to fact. That's because supercomputing brings an unmatched combination of computational capacity and capability which undisputedly strengthens the solid foundation of observation, experiment and confirming evidence. Okay, so that was an overview about supercomputing. Um, you've seen this blocky simulations here and there really mean something. They really add up to the real simulations that become really realistic of what the world is. Hence, there were also some interesting pictures and videos, of course, of things like tornadoes or other climate elements. But in the end, you would see it all looks a little bit like this, what you have here on the picture now. Uh, a bit blocky, maybe, because, of course, we want to understand it really in detail. So we have to think about these things. So domain decomposition will be one part also of our next lecture, too.
But before this, we'll have a practical lecture one one next time where I show you a little bit about, you know, C programming and scheduling and then see you then.